It unites all of humanity. It unites every single person in this room. Whether you're getting any or not, you are the product of sex. I get a lot of questions about what got me started in studying sex and how I could get into something like that. And I laugh and I shrug it off, but honestly, I think back to middle school. Let's see if this goes. Yeah, you can laugh. <laughs> this is me in middle school. It's pretty embarrassing. I feel pretty vulnerable, but this is honestly who I was and who I still am. I love soccer and I love science, but one of the things that interests me most are social interactions. In middle school, I would pay attention to who was dating whom. What was good about that guy and not that guy? And why? And when I found out that there was a science to studying attraction, the science behind sex, I was totally hooked. I really, really wanted to study this. And so I went to college and eventually came to MSU doing research looking at sex. So in particular, I study what makes males sexy and why females choose them. So these ideas are quite old, and we have to go back to Darwin to kind of get an idea of where all this starts. So many of you might have heard of Darwin's ideas for traits that help you to survive. Many of you might not know that Darwin also studied the traits that helped you get laid. Those traits are quite important, and Darwin divided those into two categories. The first category were the traits that helped you compete against rivals. The second category were the traits that made you sexy to the opposite sex. And this was pretty well received at the time because in the Victorian era, when Darwin was around, competing, males competing over uh, other males, males competing with males, happened often, right? You were competing over female rival males, that was totally normal. What wasn't so appealing to them at the time was that an animal could have a sense for aesthetics. So aesthetics at the time were reserved for the upper class. They really understood the beauty behind art and music. Could an animal do this? They doubted it. So it took about a hundred years before we started to readdress this. So going to World War II and the path between World War II and the Civil Rights Movement, so this, this general span, we're beginning to accept the fact that males and females act differently. This is probably not a surprise to anyone out there. So why? They thought it had to do with how males and females invest in reproduction. Specifically, females make very few and expensive eggs. Males make many cheap sperm. <laughs> and they thought because females are making so few eggs and they're all really costly, that that means females need to be choosier about who they mate with, right? If you're making a big gamble, you need to be selective. Whereas for males, the advantage comes when you just try to mate with whatever you can get. <laughs> and so this idea stuck around because it fit sort of human ideals at the time. And we got a little bit of a boost once we got some more knowledge after the space race. So what happened during the space race was we got a lot of new technologies. And a really nice thing was that the US was really excited about science again. And so they started to study more about the actual traits. They understood that males are varied in these, these traits that are attracted to females. So how varied are they, and how much does it matter? We got one more movement that actually helped us to go from traits to what's going on for a female to choose. And that's the women's liberation movement. So the idea of the choosy female came out. So instead of studying the physical traits that were easy to measure about the males, we started digging into the female mind. We were asking, what do women want? And this movement really helped us because we started to see that, hey, Females don't necessarily all want the same thing, and they have taste. So how does this work? Well, we got another boost in the 80s and 90s with DNA testing. So one of the nice things about DNA testing is that it can tell you who's a daddy and who's not. And so when we started to look at species like birds, which we thought were completely monogamous, they were these wonderful examples of pairing for life, they did anything but. A lot of the dads, weren't actually their kids' dads. And so these females are raising young with other males who are not the dads. So why? What makes a female think that this guy's a good dad and this guy's a good sexual partner? And for that matter, what makes a good dad in general? 
So we got to the point of asking, okay, well, sex isn't cheap for anyone. All right, so how do we think about investment and how animals should behave? And so if sex isn't cheap for anyone, males and females are dividing up how they're investing. They invest differently, but it's costly. We end up with this huge puzzle of if investment isn't driving this, what is? How do males invest? And so here at Michigan State University, I try to study what do males invest in and do females care? So this is one of my fish. This is bachelor number one, Clarence. Um, it's easier to study these things with, with a bunch of fish because if you have 200 fish in a room trying to mate, it doesn't, well, smell funny or take up a lot of space or seem noisy. Um, they're also much more able to tell you about their entire sexual history because you can keep them in a tank. It doesn't work quite as well for humans. So this is a three-spine stickleback fish. They're about the size of your finger. And the cool thing about them is that males build a nest to raise the young. And they also build a color, they also have a coloration on their throat. And they're responsible for all parental care. So they're the sole uh, provider for the kids once they're made. And the further interesting thing about them is that they dance to get a female. So not only do they have to make a color, so they have to look good, they have to build this nest so that they can take care of the kids, but they also have to behave in specific ways that matter to a female. So that means Clarence has to ask himself, well, I have only so many resources. How do I invest? Time and energy are limited. Do I give it to my looks? Do I give it to my nest? Or do I give it to my behavior? And what's going to score with a female? That's really what he's trying to figure out. So here are the bases. Many of you might have used the bases when you described your sexual encounters. We do the same for the fish. So instead of first base being a kiss, for them it's an approach. So the male has to get the female to approach him and then follow him and then examine his nest and finally enter. So the idea is simple. If we take a male and a female and we stick them in a tank together, we can get a good idea of what the female wants. And so how far she's willing to go around the bases with a hot guy, so the colorful or the very active guy, is going to be further than how far she chooses to go with the not guy. Simply, hot guys hit homers, not guys strike out. So we end up doing this hundreds and hundreds of times to get general patterns. And so just to embarrass Clarence just a little bit, we're gonna watch his virginal trial. So imagine if your first time doing anything sexual were caught on film. This is what Clarence is going through. So what you're going to see is a female being released into a tank with a male. The male has built his, his nest in that area. And you're gonna see how far Clarence is able to go on his first, well, Time it back. So the male's dancing and trying to leave the female. Didn't work the first time. He'll try it again. He'll tend to his nest for a little bit. And Clarence himself, he's not so hot. He's not a very bright guy. His nest isn't that great. He's going to try and do what he can. Um, actually, so our video got stuck. But moral of the story is, Clarence hit Homer. Let's give him a round. All right, so the nice thing about Clarence is that he's pretty awesome, and he was able to hit a homer because he somehow figured out how he needed to deposit his time and energy into certain traits. So what we do is we take hundreds of these fish, and we get them all together, and we say, okay, how much are you depositing into your looks, your nest, and your behavior, and what matters to the females? It turns out, overwhelmingly, females care about your behavior. I'll say it again, guys. Females care about your behavior. So, thank you. So it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter so much your nest. What matters overwhelmingly is your behavior. I would need a bar about the size of the Empire State Building to show you how high that actually goes. And the behavior that the male is actually doing that matters the most, the particular thing about his behavior, it's his will to mate. It's literally the vigor with which he tries to court this female. It's literally trying. So if you get nothing else, try. <laughs> so whether you're an awkward middle schooler or a suave senior, the trait of trying can be critically important to accomplishing your goals. So give it a shot. And if you're lucky, you might get lucky. <laughs>